A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. The crowd in Philippi joined in the attack on Paul and Silas, and the magistrates had them stripped and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After afflicting many blows on them, they threw them into prison and instructed the jailer to guard them securely. When he received these instructions, he put them into the innermost cell and secured their feet to a stake. About midnight, while Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God as the prisoners listened, there was suddenly such a severe earthquake that the foundations of the jail shook. All the doors flew open and the chains of all were pulled loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, thinking that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted out in a loud voice, Do no harm to yourself, we are here. He asked for a light and rushing in and, trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you and your household will be saved. So they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to everyone in his house. He took them in at that hour of the night and bathed their wounds. Then he and all his family were baptized at once. He brought them up into his house and provided the meal, and with his household rejoiced at having come to faith in God. Verbo Momini Your right hand saves me, O Lord. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with all my heart, for you have heard the words of my mouth. In the presence of the angels I will sing your praise. I will worship at your holy temple and give thanks to your name. Because of your kindness and your truth, you have made great about all things your name and your promise. When I called, you answered me. You built up strength within me. Your right hand saves me. The Lord will complete what he has done for me. Your kindness, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the work of your hands. Forbiscum, Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem, Gloria Tibi Domine. Jesus said to his disciples, Now I am going to the one who sent me. 
and not one of you asks me, where are you going? But because I told you this, grief has filled your hearts. But I tell you the truth, it is better for you that I go. For if I do not go, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and condemnation. Sin, because they do not believe in me. Righteousness, because I am going to the Father. And you will no longer see me. And condemnation, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. Verbum Domini, Lasti be Christe. Of course, the words of today's gospel follow immediately upon the verses we heard yesterday in John 16, 1 through 4, where our Lord had begun this chapter by saying that you will be persecuted. Now, he had already said in chapter 15 that if they persecuted me, they will persecute you, and that they will have their hour. And that's how he spoke of it in John 16, 1 through 4. The, those who know neither my Father nor me will have their hour. And that is one of the uh, key characteristics of those who do such persecution. It's not that they will simply say, well, all right, well, you have your religion. I have what I believe. You do what you'd like, and I'll do what I like. No, they won't do that. They expect us to do that for them if we are in the majority. But those who know neither the Father nor the Son, as soon as they get any kind of power, as soon as they think in some way they can dominate, then you can be sure that they will take that opportunity not to let us be, but to make sure that they persecute the church. That's what our Lord had said. And in, the, in that context, he says, now I'm going to the one who sent me. He had spoken of the one who sent him very frequently. He has spoken of how it was the Father. And that very key text in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son so that anyone who believes in him might have eternal life. But now it's time for Christ to return to him. And he says at this point in the discourse, not one of you asks me where you're going <clears throat> because grief has filled your hearts. Now, part of the grief would certainly be these words he had already spoken, that they who persecute me will persecute you, and they will persecute you because they don't know the Father or me. So in that context, of course, they feel great grief. It begins be to become more and more clear to them. The words Jesus had already said about his coming departure, meaning, meaning his death. And in fact, in John 13, Peter had said, well, where are you going that I can't follow? 
And our Lord speaks of his death. And again in chapter 14, he says, you know where I'm going? And Thomas says, no, we, we really don't. Uh, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And again, speaking of his death. So he had, they had asked where he was going before. But in this new context, notice how he uses the present tense. You don't ask me now. Because, again, it's dawning upon them with great sorrow what he must undergo. But then he brings out two aspects of why this is such a good thing, that he is going away. One, his return is to his father. And to be with the Father is superior to being here on earth. And he had already said in John 14, at the beginning of that chapter, those verses that we use very frequently at funerals, says, I go to prepare a place for you. And by saying that this is better for him to go, he's also saying, heaven will be better than earth. And it's a very good thing to desire heaven. Now, of course, that gives us no warrant to take our own lives to get there faster because our lives are not ours to take. So we don't do that. I've heard some silly people say, oh, I just commit suicide if heaven is better. Oh, because if I commit suicide, I won't go there. So that's a silly argument. In the... Uh, sense that we do have, though, is that as we go through whatever opposition we might experience because of our faith, that we can be sure that this is a better place for Jesus and for us, and that he's preparing that place for us. But then a second element of why it's better for us during this life there is an advantage to Jesus ascending to the Father. Namely, that if I do not go, the advocate will not come to you. Now that word advocate is the Greek word paraclete, parakletos. And this is, a, a, again, it's a translation that's very good, um, advocate, sometimes counselor, and sometimes people just leave the Greek word paraclete. And the sense of advocate is closer to uh, a word still used very much in Polish for a lawyer. You call a lawyer an advocat. And just taking that Latin word, advocate. And, it's a, and that's what it means in Greek as well. A lawyer, a defense lawyer. The kind of counselor you call to your side. That's what it also means in Greek, one called to your side. An advocate is one who's called to you in Latin. So this is somebody you call upon to be your defender. And that this same advocate is also defined in chapter 14 and chapter 15, verse 26, as the Holy Spirit and also the spirit of truth. And that this is a gift that the Lord gives when he ascends. Now, this is an important part of our theology of the ascension, which is coming up soon. And we'll be celebrating the feast of the ascension. And this sense of Christ ascending to the Father so that he might send the Holy Spirit is what's going on here because the same Holy Spirit will dwell within us. And there are very many aspects of that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we don't have time to go through all of them, but what our Lord mentions here is that the Holy Spirit will have a number of tasks. He had already said, he will lead you into all truth. He will remind you of the words I have said. 
Christ had said that he, with the Holy Spirit, would give us the words to say when we are persecuted, back in Matthew chapter 10. All of these, plus many more senses of his empowering and his giving of gifts and his giving of virtues, all of that is continued on in the text of Scripture. But in this text, it speaks of how he will convict the world in this sense of our defense lawyer is inevitably going to be successful in that trial of life. He will show that that which is evil is evil. He will convict it of being wrong. And that if we allow him into our lives and have that indwelling of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit so that the Blessed Trinity dwells within us, that we can trust that he will be our advocate to defend us. But his defense of those who follow Christ will inevitably lead to a conviction for the world. Now that's important to remember. Because, in many ways, uh, throughout history, the world has shown great power to persecute the church. The communists did that in the 20th century, killing tens of millions of Christians. National socialists, the Nazis, they killed millions of Christians for, because of their faith along with killing the Jews, of course, they also killed many Christians. And the, uh, we've seen the Roman Empire, the so-called liberals of the French Revolution, and many others throughout history. And we'll see certainly much more of it. And he is going to convict the world, even though it looks as if they are winning. There are times when people in the world get a little bit carried away with the headiness of what they think is their victory. And we can see some of that going on around us. There's a certain headiness taking place in parts of our culture in this country today. And they think <clears throat> that they have evolved our society to a point of accepting a wide variety of sins. And they'll say, it is now the law. It is the law that you can kill babies in the womb. It is the law in some states where you can kill people who are terminally ill. It is the law in 11 states that people of the same gender can attempt marriage. It's, you know, they, and they'll say, see, we're inevitably going to take over that's going to be their headiness. However, the paraclete will convict them in regard to sin because they don't believe in me. They don't trust that the one who is the giver of the laws about human nature and about worship of God are true. They don't believe that God has the power to say, this is what is right. You can get all kinds of things passed as laws. People have done that through the centuries. And knowing history indicates that Nazis could get it declared a law that Jews are to be arrested and then executed. That was the law. And if, and for instance, in Poland, if you even gave so much as a piece of bread to a Jew, you would be executed too. So, you know, they made that a law. But that passed away. It was condemned because it was wrong. And so also will all other laws that are wicked be condemned. And the Holy Spirit will bring that conviction of what is truly sin in itself. And no matter what they do to haul various people into court in order to support their laws. And many, we'll see many hauled into court 
That threat is going on already in many countries. They will still be shown to be sin. In terms of righteousness, now this seems odd. He'll convict the world about righteousness because Jesus goes to the Father. What's going on there? You have to understand that in the Old Testament, righteousness was used as a declaration in court, in law courts, to say that somebody was innocent, you called them righteous. If they were guilty, you called them evil. Rasha. So, Tzedek and Rasha were the two choices. We say guilty or not guilty in our law system. They said innocent as righteousness or righteous or guilty as was wicked. And they considered Jesus the wicked one when they put him on trial, even though they changed how they prosecuted him. They prosecuted him for being God. Then before Pilate, they prosecuted him for trying to be a king. And they, they went back and forth, but eventually got him pers uh, condemned and declared wicked. But the Holy Spirit will show that because Jesus has been, will be raised from the dead and has been raised from the dead now, by the time Jesus is saying it on uh, Holy Thursday, he had not yet been raised from the dead. So his resurrection will prove that he is the innocent one. He is the righteous one, and the Holy Spirit will convict them of that. And then finally, he'll convict them about condemnation. Because the ruler of this world has been condemned. The ruler of this world, this world of darkness, is Satan. And that, you know, remember, when our Lord was tempted in the wilderness, Satan said, bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all these kingdoms. Notice, our Lord did not say, oh, you don't own those kingdoms. No, he assumed that he did. But Jesus would not break God's law and worship a creature, but only worship the Lord God. And therefore, he didn't get the kingdoms as a gift from Satan. Instead, by conquering sin and death, Jesus snatches kingdoms from Satan, but not by a war, but rather, not, at least not by a physical war, but he snatches kingdoms from Satan by calling people to believe and by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that in the conversion of hearts to Christ, to know the Father and the Son, and to receive the spirit of truth. He will condemn the evil one as the father of murders and the father of lies. And that, as Jesus had said in John 8, 44. And so this sense of the absolute confidence that the world will experience its condemnation if it follows Satan, and it will experience Christ's redemption and righteousness and declaration of innocence before God if it follows him. We each make that choice, and we call the world to do the same. And in this way, we help to evangelize the world and bring about the transformation that it needs.